Hello everyone, hope studying is going well. If you're new, my name is Rahul Demania. I am a board certified pediatrician and currently I'm doing my fellowship in pediatric critical care. Over the past five years, I have been absolutely passionate about helping students just like you kick ass on the step one exam. Today's lecture, we're going to be talking about Down syndrome. And Down syndrome is so high yield for your step one. Why? Because it has a multi-system integration. And today we're going to be breaking it down by systems and figuring out how exactly test makers are going to phrase the various test questions related to Down syndrome. To get us warmed up, let's go ahead and look at a clinical vignette for your exam. A pediatric patient is presenting to the cardiology clinic for evaluation. Echo shows a primum ASD and regurgitation of AV valves bilaterally. What genetic abnormality may be associated with these findings? The key in this question is going to be recognizing primum ASD as well as this regurgitation of AV valves. Remember that the AV valves are going to be formed from the endocardial cushions. And thus, the abnormality, and hey, this is the lecture we're talking about, that's going to be Down syndrome. Now, if we take a step back, the most common ASD in the general population, that's going to be your ostium secundum ASD. Down syndrome patients have ostium primum ASDs. Remember that in Down syndrome, you are going to have ostium primum ASDs because that is the tissue that actually grows from the endocardial cushions. If we talk about the physical exam description of an ASD, that is going to be a fixed S2. That is high yield for you to recognize on your step one exam. Remember that S2 normally, if we just integrate some cardiac physiology, S2 is going to represent this split of the aortic and pulmonic valve closing upon inspiration. And normally you have this variable split with inspiration and expiration, but a fixed S2 means that you have no variability during your respiratory phases. Now, this conceptual question is going to be very important. What is the difference between an ASD and a PFO? Now, when I was going through this, I was like, whoa, those are just two holes at the top of the heart. But if we dig in a little bit deeper, ASD is a failure of a tissue to form. Ostium primum ASDs, for example. It's the primum tissue that has failed to form embryologically. That's what we say in Down syndrome patients. Whereas PFO is actually a failure of the foramen ovale to close. And remember, the foramen ovale was going to close embryologically because of fusion of two septal tissues. So ASD, failure of the tissue to form, whereas PFO is a failure of the fusion or the for foramen ovale to close. This is going to be our last slide, ladies and gentlemen, and we're going to be talking about integrating Down syndrome the various test questions. The first thing we'll go through are the key physical findings. Down syndrome patients are going to have these upslanting palpebral fissures and prominent epicanthal folds. These are your eye findings that you have to keep in mind. Now, if you see a picture on your USMLE in which they have a patient who has Down syndrome facies and they're zooming in on the eyes and you see on the colored portion of these eyes, these pale centers, you're going to be thinking about the brush field spots. Down syndrome patients also are going to have this single transverse palmar crease, as well as these sandal gap toes. And this is the MSK findings for Down syndrome. Let's go ahead and talk about, from a neurological standpoint, what these Down syndrome patients are going to have. Well, on your exam, they love for you to know not only intellectual disability, but early onset Alzheimer's. Now, the mechanism here is absolutely imperative for you to know. Remember that in neurology, when we talk about Alzheimer's disease, we talk about the amyloid precursor protein, APP. And APP can be cleaved either via alpha cleavage or beta cleavage. Now, beta cleavage is kind of the bad one in the sense that if you have more beta cleavage, you are going to have A beta plaques that form. And that's the pathological hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. Now, in Down syndrome patients, they have 
three copies, because it's trisomy 21, three copies of the APP. And thus, they have an increased tendency to form a beta plaques. Early onset Alzheimer's, Down syndrome, gotta know it. From a CV standpoint, we talked about the AV canal defects, what we call endocardial cushion defects, VSDs, and what kind of ASDs, guys? That's gonna be, you got it, your ostium primum ASDs, very good. From a GI standpoint, there are two integrative cases that you have to know. Number one is gonna be duodenal atresia. Now, duodenal atresia, they give you an x-ray and they show that double bubble sign, the gastric bubble, and then distally, you're gonna see another dilation on your KUB x-ray. The other thing that you have to understand are the, these patients with duodenal atresia, are they gonna have bilious or non-bilious emesis? And the answer is, they're gonna have bilious emesis because it's distal to the stomach. Down syndrome patients are also going to have Hirschsprung's disease. Now, Hirschsprung's disease, how do they present this? This is a baby who cannot poop within the first 48 hours, i.e. they fail to pass meconium. And the mechanism here is the failure of migration of the Auerbach's myenteric plexus. Now remember, the Auerbach's myenteric plexus, guys, this is a histology tie-in. And that is that nerve plexus that is going to control the inner circular and outer longitudinal muscle. Hematologically, Down syndrome patients are going to have ALL after the age of five and megakaryoblastic AML before the age of five. Pathoma does a great job, but remember that five, age five cutoff is really going to be helpful for you to understand. From an endocrine standpoint, think about Down syndrome patients as having a little bit of autoimmune diseases associated with them. And that is type one diabetic keto, uh, type one diabetes, as well as hypothyroidism. Now, how does type one diabetes present? Type one diabetes on your exam usually presents as diabetic ketoacidosis. So they'll have a child who comes in, polyuria, polydipsia, and then bam, they give you a blood gas that shows anion gap metabolic acidosis. And why do they have an anion gap? That's because of increased accumulation of beta hydroxybutyrate. Finally, from an MSK standpoint, you're going to be thinking about atlantoaxial instability for Down syndrome patients. Now, atlantoaxial instability is essentially an instability at the upper cervical vertebrae. And this is extremely important for you to understand because on the exam, they give you a scenario of a Down syndrome patient going to the OR and when they come back from the OR, they have a lot of upper motor neuron signs indicating that the spinal cord was severed. And why is that? Well, if you are going to the OR, you likely will need a breathing tube placed. And in order for you to place a breathing tube into the airway, you need to hyperextend the neck. But if these Down syndrome patients have atlantoaxial instability, which means they have at the upper cervical vertebrae some laxity, they have an increased tendency for actually severing the cord. And that's really important for you to understand. So in summary, guys, this is the way you need to study. You need to take a multi-system pathology like Down syndrome and integrate. Okay, early onset Alzheimer's, what's the mechanism? The cardiovascular tie-ins, duodenal atresia, Hirschsprung's disease, the leukemic tie-ins, and understand the fact that Down syndrome patients have key characteristic physical exam findings that then clue you in to these multi-system pathologies. I hope that this video was helpful. Feel free to just check out all of my resources, which I've currently come out with. I have a study plan. I have a step one UWorld note that will really save you time on actually going through UWorld blocks. And I also have a rapid review course that covers a lot of these concepts in the days leading up to your exam that's exactly what you need. You need something that's integrative and you need something that is to the point. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one.